Good afternoon and welcome to What's Up Kansas City. My name is Jim Watts and we're located right here in the historical district, the home of the Jazz Hall of Fame and the Negro Baseball Museum. Today we have a very exciting program and I have my dear friend Mr. Warren Watkins sitting to my left and to my right we have Mr. Mark Robb and they are two of the experts in Kansas City at this particular time dealing with the slave graves at KCI-MCI Airport. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank All you. right, Mr. Watkins, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about Warren Watkins. Warren R. Watkins, Jr., retired Martin and film director, Kansas City area for the last 50 years, and uh, uh, chair of the uh, Watkins Foundation. Uh, a few years ago, the city of Kansas City uh, filed in Platte County to move some graves. And these were European graves, but they never found the slave graves, or they never tried to find the slave graves. So being interested in history, and family being interested in history here in Kansas City for the last 110 years, I felt like I need to be involved and finding out more information. And after the court case, we realized that Kansas City was in violation, in violation of what we call the 106 Historical Preservation Act. And Mark will uh, explain a little bit of that. Okay, uh, Mark, uh, why don't you tell the people about who you are and give us, set the stage for the historical presence at, the, at that area. Okay, my, my name is Mark Robb. I'm adjunct professor of geosciences at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. I'm an archaeologist, a professional archaeologist, and have been for many years. I've worked on a number of projects similar to the one that we're talking about here today. And my interest in the project really stems from the fact that what we have at KCI Airport is almost unique. It's a preserved cultural landscape that goes back well over a hundred years. The airport controls, I don't know, maybe 12,000 acres. It may be the largest municipal airport in the United States. And the land that it controls today is largely undeveloped, but in the 1800s, it was the home to thousands of enslaved African Americans as well as the their white owners who operated farms in that, that area of Platte County. And we're concerned that the cultural property, the memories, the cultural contributions to the history of this region in the United States of those folks, that those needs to be preserved in their physical resting places, their graves that are still out there deserve to be accounted for and to protect it in a respectful way. And that's a project that we've been working on, trying to get that done since the court case that, that Warren mentioned in 2007-2008. My part of this project is to contribute my expertise as an archaeologist who has worked in the past with burials, human remains, and the application of federal law that pertains to the protection of those things under the law, laws which the airport is bound to follow, but in our opinion has not been following for decades. We hope to change that. Tell us a little bit about, because most people when you say slave graves at the airport, they don't understand about slavery, plantations, uh, shackles and chains, they, they, they most, most of the, keep in mind, most of the people who might listen to this, they know, they don't know very little about, about history, about slavery. You want to, who wants to talk about that? Yeah, back in, um, mm. a couple hundred years ago, um, the sentence came from, um, came from Virginia. And the ground here was just like Virginia's ground in regards to planting hemp and tobacco. And uh, most of the farms here were like, uh, they were farms. There were two or three slaves. Now, I came from uh, Hughes Plantation, which is sitting, or was sitting, 
on the uh, runway one and also uh, on um, the terminal eight. And at that time, there was no law. And so they could move how they wanted to. But now there's a law, I had a law, that started back in, uh, in, um, in the 70s that protected. They protected the Indian graves, they protected the um, slave graves, and then they protected the European graves. At that time, Kansas City wasn't here. You had Parkville, you had um, a Westport. Uh, Kansas City wasn't even in existence at that time. But it was active around here. Matter of fact, it was so active that it was called Little Dixie. Even the government felt like that uh, this area was important because they started what they call the Freedom Frontier National Heritage Area. All these uh, border wars and all these uh, different battles and uh, the lives and aboriginists and all was around. Missouri was a slave state, Kansas was a free state. So if you escaped, you can get down to the Missouri River, cross the river, and to Quindare in Kansas, and he was free. So he had a lot of escapes back and forth, escapes back and forth. Uh, the history of uh, that ground up there is very important. It's pristine, archaeological find right now. In other words, there's foundations there, there's graves there. And the law permits to protect these things, just like the uh, Indians in uh, Standing Rock. They were trying to protect their graves, trying to protect their water rights. Same thing. Now, Mark, uh, they say that slavery in, up in Platte County was different than in, in the South, meaning that uh, two or three slaves, no big slave plantations, the slaves lived in to, you know, lived in the same house with the slave owners. I think that was, why don't you speak, speak about that? Yeah, the institution of slavery in Missouri was a little different than it was in the Deep South in states like Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi. I mean, most of us know, I guess at least have some general awareness that in those states, African Americans were enslaved on really essentially industrial scale farms. And in this part of the world, the farms were much smaller. Uh, as uh, Warren pointed out, slaves often lived in relatively small numbers with white families, often living in the same houses. And the reason that's important here uh, is because in those days, uh, black folks and white folks alike often were buried right there on the farms where they lived. And very often they didn't have elaborate markers put on their graves. Now, if you fast forward 100 to 150 years later, you go to that area today, and there were thousands of these folks living in the area that now makes up the airport. You go to that area today, and out there on that landscape, there is no question about it, that there are small family cemeteries out there that, that we've lost track of. The markers are gone or were never marked in the first place, so those graves are still out there. And when the airport goes out there to build something, and they do intend to develop over the next few decades those 12,000 acres, those construction activities are inevitably going to disturb those graves. There are procedures under federal law that allow those graves to be detected relatively easily and inexpensively, and to be dealt with respectfully, and to give us information about the history of the folks involved. And we mean to see that that history is honored and understood. And in order to do that, the airport needs to adopt a formal plan for how it's going to monitor these areas during construction so that graves and other important cultural remains can be detected and dealt with quickly and relatively inexpensively and to preserve that history. Now major airports around the country have plans to do that. KCI does not and we think they should. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the only time that Butch and Mark will come before us uh, so we can share the information with the community. There's a lot more to this issue than we can go into today. But we'll be back in another couple of weeks
to talk more about the slave graves at KCI. Like Mr. Watkins said, the plantation that his family was part of was was Terminal One, and it was the the huge uh, it was a huge plantation. So that that means very possibly that the airport has been built on slave graves without any recognition. Now, what I would encourage each one of you to do is to contact your city councilman, your state representative, and various other city's officials and ask them the questions about the slave graves at KCI. Now, what I want to do at this point, I'm, Mr. Watkins, I want them, you to give them your contact information, how they can reach you. Uh, Facebook, Watkins Foundation Historical Society. And my uh, number is uh, 816. 547-9905. Could you repeat that again? 816 9 four, four, 9 I'm sorry. Take your time. 816-547-9905. Also on the, uh, uh, there was a documentary that was done by Gary Jenkins uh, called Negroes to Hire. And it tells a uh, documentary story of slave at, uh, in Missouri particularly in Missouri, and that would be a good reference to, uh, to see. And I think it's in the public library, too, where you can find it online. Okay, Mark, would you like to give, leave, leave your uh, information? Yeah, as I said before, I work in the Department of Geosciences at UMKC. If you go to their webpage, you can find my email address there, and I would be happy to try to answer your emails. Okay, then would you like to leave your emails to the audience? Yeah, my email is rob, R-A-A-B-L, at umkc dot edu. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you for viewing and listening to us today. This is What's Up Kansas City, Jim Watts. We appreciate you. Remember, the strength of the wolf is in the pack. I'm IFBB Bikini Pro Cat Williams, and when I'm not working out in the gym, I'm searching the web on Cascade Media and What's Up Kansas City. So make sure you check them out.